And for that reason, you need uh, greater cloud separation and visibility to be able to safely see and avoid these faster airplanes. And so I call this the uh, high standard visibility and cloud clearance. Uh, a memory aid for this is uh, five F-111s. Uh, five represents the five statute miles visibility you need to have to fly VFR. And then the uh, uh, F-111 is a fighter bomber and it uh, is handy just because it has the three ones in its title. So that means that you'll need to uh, maintain cloud clearance or cloud separation of a thousand feet above the cloud, a thousand feet below the cloud, and one statute mile horizontal. Then um, the next one that you'll need to memorize would be the low standard visibility, what I call the low standard visibility, and that is uh, three miles visibility, a thousand feet above a cloud, 500 feet below, and 2,000 feet horizontal. This would apply to flying in uh, class Charlie airspace, class Echo airspace, and class Delta airspace, as well as if you're flying below 10,000 feet uh, at night in class G airspace. And then uh, Bravo airspace is in a class by itself, and Bravo airspace requires you to have three miles visibility, but just clear of clouds. And you'd think uh, Bravo airspace should be more restrictive since there are many large aircraft that fly there that ATC would uh, try to keep separated from VFR airplanes by a greater cloud distance, not just clear of clouds. But uh, air traffic control doesn't let you fly into class Bravo airspace unless they can give you IFR type separation. So that's the reason they let uh, us have just a clear of clouds for our cloud clearance limit. The, uh, the last two are Class G airspace below 10,000 feet MSL but above 1,200 feet AGL. And I call this the, uh, the middle G airspace and I designate it to half go for it because the visibility and cloud clearance for G airspace in this middle altitude and G airspace below 1200 feet AGL uh, get very low and if you're going to go fly in those kind of conditions you're essentially going for it not really paying attention to the bad weather and it's not that I want you to do that but it's a good memory aid it uh, starts with G so um, if you're flying in this middle G airspace which there's not much of anyway most of the time it's uh, the only place you're going to fly in class G airspace above 1200 feet is in a mountainous region you would need, uh, in the daytime, one mile visibility and one statute mile visibility and a standard 152 cloud clearance. And then, if you happen to be flying in G airspace below 1200 feet AGL, um, you can fully go for it, or you can have one mile visibility and clear of clouds to operate in. And another way to help remember these requirements is, uh, would be that there is no going for it at night or in class G airspace or E airspace if you're below 10,000 feet at night um, you use the low standard of three statute miles and a thousand above 500 below and 2,000 horizontal. Some people have trouble memorizing the uh, the 500 feet below versus the thousand feet above and get it flipped around and say okay I have to be a thousand feet below the clouds and 500 feet above the clouds and they get confused or was it the other way. Uh, one way to remember is um, when these rules were first developed, uh, a DC-3 was a, the common airliner, and a DC-3 would climb at 1,000 feet per minute, but it would only descend at 500 feet per minute because it was unpressurized and people's ears uh, would hurt if they descended at 1,000 feet per minute. So if you imagine that uh, if this airliner flew out of a cloud layer and you, had a, you were a VFR plane flying on top, then you'll have a minute until this aircraft would reach your altitude or if you were flying 500 feet below a cloud layer and this airliner flew out of the clouds descending at 500 feet per minute you'd also have a minute there to um, look for the traffic and avoid it. Uh, 2,000 foot of horizontal cloud uh, separation is not very much if you think about it. This could be a matter of if two aircraft are traveling at uh, 3 uh, miles a minute or about 180 miles an hour. This could reduce your separation down uh, or your time to acquire the other aircraft down to about 10 seconds and that doesn't seem like a lot of time and um, you do wind up though when you're searching for traffic 
traffic looking out horizontally most of the time at your same altitude, so you have a greater likelihood of seeing an aircraft like this in a lesser time frame. Okay, the uh, next item I'm going to talk about are the mode C requirements for different types of airspace. By the way, this uh, other section here, where it talks about Class E and G airspace, will go through the uh, five different floors of Class E airspace, as I mentioned uh, just a minute ago. Okay, here are the Mode C transponder requirements. And I mentioned in the handout that a Mode A transponder is capable only of transmitting a squat code like 1200 or 4, what did I put there, 4254 to air traffic control. Uh, an older Mode A transponder does not transmit uh, an altitude of your aircraft. And the Mode C transponder uh, does. It has an altitude encoder that's hooked up to your pedostatic system, and then that uh, pressure altitude value is uh, transmitted electronically to the transponder and then transmitted to air traffic control when the transponder is interrogated by air traffic control's radar. So, where do you need a Mode C transponder? You'll need a Mode C transponder everywhere across the continental U.S. Um, when you're flying above 10,000 feet MSL, unless you're within 2,500 feet AGL. The reason for this is that uh, aircraft are allowed to go faster than 250 knots above 10,000 feet MSL, so it would be helpful if the airliners and uh, many of the other aircraft that have uh, active uh, traffic uh, collision alert systems can see you. So you may not have a traffic collision alert system yourself, although uh, some aircraft like Cirruses and um, Garmin 1000 equipped air, Garmin 1000 equipped aircraft usually do have some kind of traffic collision avoidance system. Um, even if you don't have one of those systems, the other aircraft like a Southwest Airlines 737 would, and if they encounter you, they'll be able to see you on their uh, visual display and avoid you, even if they don't visually acquire you and see you with their eyes. So. The unless within 2,500 feet EGL allows you to fly over mountain ranges, like if you're going to fly to um, Reno from San Francisco, you don't have to zigzag through mountain canyons trying to stay below 10,000 feet MSL. If you just clear the mountain peaks by a couple thousand feet, you're still uh, legal to fly without a mode C transponder. And then you also need a mode C transponder within 30 nautical miles of the primary airport of a class Bravo uh, airspace or airport from the surface up to 10,000. So you already needed the mode C above 10,000 and then if you're within 30 nautical miles of a Bravo airport you'll need the mode C from 10,000 on down to the surface or you just plain need it. And then the last requirement is for class Charlie airspace you need a mode C transponder inside and above class Charlie up to 10,000 feet, but not below the shelf. So if there was a, uh, a class golf airport below the shelf of the uh, between the 5 and 10 mile range, then you do not need a mode C transponder to land there. If you fly through the Charlie airspace or if you fly even above the Charlie airspace at 7,000 feet or something like that, you'll still need a mode C transponder so air traffic control can actually see what your altitude is. If they see that you don't have a mode C transponder, they're going to assume you're flying underneath the shelf and not worry about you at that low altitude. Now, all the aircraft that operate out of San Carlos and Palo Alto and Hayward airports are all within 30 nautical miles of San Francisco, so they're all equipped with mode C transponders. The only thing you have to worry about is if one fails. If one fails, it could have the, uh, the mode C altitude encoder uh, portion fails, so air traffic control can see your squat code but not your altitude, or the entire transponder can fail and not transmit an altitude or a squat code. It's still possible to come back into an airport like San Carlos and land if you had gone on a cross country into California Central Valley, but you're responsible to contact air traffic control and let them know that your transponder is not functioning and uh, if they don't tell you to avoid coming into the San Francisco Mode C Vale area, then you can construe that as permission to enter or a waiver of this requirement. 
So that's what the text I have here. If you're in mode C where entire transponder is an operative, you can uh, enter the airspace like class uh, Bravo or Charlie if you notify air traffic control and they approve. And of course, the benefit of talking to air traffic control would be that when you change altitudes, you can advise them that you're changing altitudes and then they'll keep a mental picture of your altitude and help you stay separated from other aircraft. And then the last item, I wanted to talk about. Oh, I should mention uh, before I get into special VFR the entry requirements for class B, C, and D airspace. For class D airspace, the smallest tower airports, you need to establish two way radio contact before entry and um, before entry to the Delta airspace. And two way radio contact equals uh, air traffic control says your call sign back to you and doesn't tell you to remain clear of the airspace. So you've called air traffic control with your call sign, they say it back to you, and that's it. They don't say remain clear of my airspace. And then class Charlie airspace is very similar. Um, established two-way radio contact, but in this case uh, with the tower is, is a possibility, or normally if you're coming from a distance, you talk to approach control first, and then you talk to the respective tower. So if you were going to San Jose, you'd call NorCal approach first, and then as you got closer, NorCal approach would tell you to contact San Jose tower as you got within typically like five miles of the airport as you get to the inner core of the Charlie. And um, by the way, class uh, Charlie and Bravo approach control frequencies are typically printed in boxes on the chart uh, in the geographic areas where you should use them. So you'll just look on the chart in the nearest area uh, to the nearest frequency box for the area you're in and then use that frequency to contact air traffic control. And then class B airspace is very different. For class B airspace, you do have to establish two-way radio contact and you have to get a specific clearance to enter the class Bravo airspace from either the tower, like San Francisco Tower, or from the approach control, like NorCal approach control. And then the last item that I wanted to go over is uh, special VFR weather operations. Uh, an airport like uh, a Bravo, Charlie, or Delta Tower Airport is considered to be VFR if the weather conditions at that airport uh, are at least a thousand foot ceiling or greater and um, broken and overcast constitute a ceiling, few and scattered do not. And also the uh, visibility at the airport has to be over three nautical miles, or sorry, I should say three nautical miles or more. And if an airport's uh, experiencing those weather conditions, it's said to be VFR. If it's not experiencing those weather conditions for uh, one or both of those reasons, either because of less than a thousand foot ceiling or less than three miles visibility, then the airport is not uh, VFR or below basic VFR weather minimums. And the only way to operate in or out of the airport would be to get a special VFR clearance or to fly IFR. And if you don't have an instrument rating, then flying IFR under instrument flight rules is not a possibility. Um, and one other uh, airport uh, you could uh, use the special VFR weather uh, privilege, actually, if you can get a special VFR clearance, to is a class E airspace designated for the surface. So this would only apply like an airport like South Lake Tahoe when class echo airspace goes all the way down to the surface of the earth. And normally at South Lake Tahoe, you'd need three miles visibility and a thousand foot ceiling to land. If the airport didn't have that and you got a special VFR clearance to land there, then you could enter uh, the airspace with as little as one mile visibility and clear of clouds, the same as the class golf airspace requirements below 1,200 feet in the daytime or the full go for it. And you have to ask air traffic controls for a special VFR clearance. Air traffic control can't offer it to you. They can't lead you to be bold and go for it because there's a degree of danger in doing this if you're flying around with one mile visibility or flying around under a 500 foot ceiling and uh, they don't want to be responsible for having uh, enticed somebody to do something uh, stupid where they might kill themselves. So once you ask for that clearance, uh, air traffic control could say something like Cessna 4 at 49 Delta is cleared out of the Palo Alto uh, Class D airspace to the north, maintains special VFR conditions, which would be the one mile visibility and the clear of clouds. 
uh, and report when clear of the class delta airspace.